All right, welcome to the Rapcast. Uh, my name is Zarar, and uh, my guest today is uh, the managing editor of Raptors Republic, Louis Satzman. What's going on, man? Not too much, man. It's uh, it's good to see. You. It's been a little while since we've done a video. Uh, yeah, I mean, you've been so busy. I mean, ever since you got that blue tick on Twitter, I mean, it's just <laughs> you're hard to find. Uh, how do you feel? I mean, forget about the Raptors. How do you feel having a blue tick on uh, on Twitter? Is it true what they say that everything grows by an inch? Yeah, no. So I had to leave my wife, like get a get a new, younger, hotter wife. Like, no, everything's upgrading. It's good. Don't tell her I said that. Oh my god! Okay, this is going in, man. Uh, so uh, hopefully uh, your wife's cool with this one. Um, yeah, the, the the blue thing is uh, is interesting. How um, and 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 I bet the the blue tick has a big influence on what people see in their feeds because I would assume that if you have a blue tick, Twitter would sort of promote that content a little bit more, so it becomes this like vicious cycle of the same people sort of being promoted over and over again but hey man it's all good because you're now part of the uh the the inner circle so uh i don't know man i I think you're one of those democrats who eats babies i think you've joined that circle it's happened there's a tab now that was not available to me before to me before where i can only see other blue tick posts Oh really? Or notifications, or whatever. Yeah, that that was not something that I had before. And oh really? That's an optional viewing viewing ability now. I mean, we know we, we talk about the elite, and and here it is, man. It's this, this is what elite looks like. <laughs> uh, it, it, it's funny because I did not know that. I didn't know you had a separate tab, uh, but I know that Twitter also launched something called Twitter Blue, which is um, you you pay for Twitter, and you I guess you have some other features. Do you have that, or do you get that for free? Do you did you even know about it? Oh, I don't know. I've actually like, it's kind of ironic because I I got verified around the same time I stopped using Twitter, like nearly as much. I've been trying to take a break during the off season. And so I actually don't know if I have the those features or not. Probably not. I don't think I do. All right. All right, man. So um, around the time you, uh, you got verified, which is really the headline story of this podcast, <laughs> uh, something else happened. Uh, Scotty Barnes played a couple of games. And before we get to his 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 uh, his basketball play, uh, you know, I, I was I was at the draft party. You were there as well, and we saw the reaction that people had when he was picked, and it was like, oh my god, I don't know what we're doing. You know, is Jalen Suggs? You know, we, I thought we had a plan. What are we even doing? Picking a guy who can't shoot. So everybody's kind of on a bit of a low, and we have the video to prove it, right? Because because the, the reaction was there, mm-hmm. and you know, he plays a game, has a great game in in the, in the first summer league. And immediately, Masai is a genius. Like, mm-hmm. oh my God, look at this! How, how, I mean, you know, the 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 sine curve of emotions is just going up and down. He has two or three bad games. It's like this guy can't play, man. Like, you know, like what have we done here? I mean, what you know? It, the, the reaction again goes very negative. And then he has one amazing game uh, against uh, the Hornets. I think uh, he, he ends off strong. Emotions are back up. So within this brief period of Scotty Barnes, we've seen a, a very, you know, high variance of fan reaction. What do you, has that always been the case or is this something, uh, something new that, that you've seen? No, that's always been the case. I think the, um, the media th- or the medium through which fan reaction is viewed is different in that now we see the, you know, the daily, even the hourly change of reaction. Whereas before we might not have seen that from other fans before Twitter, before social media, but it was definitely there. So I don't think that's a, that's anything unique for Scotty Barnes. Um, it's just whatever people enjoy for fandom, right? Some people are fans for the highs and the lows. They, they want to feel all the feelings because that's the prism that sports brings them. The way that light shines through lets them, you know, be upset about a summer league game, which seems to me to be insane. If you're letting your emotions ride on summer league, then sports must really like ruin you when there's a real loss, like a playoff loss. You must just be devastated. So, um, yeah, it's not it's certainly not the way I understand it. But uh, Scotty Barnes is a good, uh, good mirror, right? Let's people see what they want, whether they hate him, they love him happy, sad. Uh, he's definitely engendered a lot of emotion. Yeah. And that's a, that's a good, good perspective because I, I think it, 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 it does have to do with how, like how 
close your pulse is to the team. If you really are checking the pulse of the team after every possession, then yeah, your reaction is going to be different because everything affects you. But maybe if you check your pulse after every every game, after you've had a chance to maybe sleep on it, you sort of maybe take things in, in, in a little bit more stride, I guess. Yeah. Uh, but But his actual game, so far what I have noticed is that the shot isn't as bad as people made it out to be. The form isn't amazing, but it's not that it's not fixable. It's not that it, I can see that it will, if he works on it, there will be a path to success and perhaps even a path to a higher shooting percentage. How, how do you evaluate his shot? Because I know you're not a guy who follows the draft closely. You kind of see the, the NBA mm-hmm. product and, and base your opinions on that. Given his shot, do you have any concerns on, on whether it'll be able to develop to what, what we need it to be? Yeah, no concerns. Um, I think he he will become a good catch and shoot shooter. Um, you know his his base is solid. Um, he has some nice nice wrist action. Uh, his pull up shot I'm less confident in, um, which is a really interesting thing because there's two types of jumpers, right? Pull up and catch and shoot. And the Raptors have shown a real ability to develop catch and shoot shooting. You know Pascal Siakam even you know, during his down stretches is a fine catch and shoot shooter. He's passable, you know, stretch, stretch the floor from the corners when he's open, even during his down streaks. But the Raptors have never really shown the ability to develop a pull-up jumper. Um, you know, OG maybe, but it's not something he really takes too much. Um, Pascal, no, Norm became a good pull-up shooter, but um, he was, you know, uh, always a, a better shooter than these other type of prospects we're discussing. And so I think Barnes will become a good catch and shoot shooter, certainly a passable one um, over the next two, three seasons, but a pull-up shot. I don't know if that's in his future. And it's um, something that the NBA is actually trying to, or winning in the NBA is drifting more and more towards pull-up shooting being a necessary condition. You know, it's not enough to cause you to win, but without it, it's hard. And yeah. Kawhi Leonard gave Toronto that most of all. And, uh, and the Raptors are saying, doesn't matter to us. We're getting guys. We'll make them catch and shoot shooters. We'll figure out the rest. So it's interesting. Yeah. And it also ties into the sort of the return of the mid-range game. You see the, uh, mm-hmm. the mid-range game coming back. And the mid-range game is coming back because the pull-up shot is coming back. Uh, you know, it, it's, I've always said that it's like the free market, man. You know, once something gets saturated, some other competitive edge needs to be found somewhere else. And in this case, now that the three-point shot is sort of saturated and everybody does it, People are trying to see, okay, what do other teams, uh, what what do they, like, where's the hole in their defense? And you notice that a lot of people are pressing on the three-point line and leaving the mid-range open. And then what's old is new again. The mid-range game is back. And um, and, and 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 that's where maybe the Raptors' development efforts are going to be focused on. And one of the, you mentioned that the Raptors haven't been able to develop, um, a, a, you know, strong pull-up games in their, in their guards, in their younger mm-hmm. players. But maybe that's because that hasn't been the focus. Maybe the focus now shifts yeah. to doing that. So you're you're changing basically what's hot. Yeah. Fred was only a catch and shoot shooter for a long time. His pull up shot has been developing. Last year he was an a, you know an above average pull up three point shooter. So Van Fleet and he also you know went to the mid range for like the first time in his career. He became a little bit of a mid range shooter. So I, I agree with you. It's something that maybe it has been lacking because they haven't been emphasizing it. Maybe they'll start emphasizing it. I know that Nick Nurse talks about his de- his shooting development program as like a four to five year system. Mm-hmm. And you know we were talking about Pascal Siakam um, the last time I was there in person. Like 1920, right? 2019, 2020 season. And he, Nick Nurse was very open. Like he's not gone all the way through the system. There's still elements to be added. And so maybe that's the the end of the, the development curve. But a lot of these guys, you know, haven't had that amount of time. I mean, Nick Nurse hasn't been a head coach for the ma- that amount of time. So I think a lot of um, the Raptors shooting development system, we actually don't know what the end points are because they themselves admit they haven't got to the end point with anyone. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and, you know, tying into the Scotty Barnes pick um, is, is the Raptors, I guess, shift in philosophy. It's like where everybody else digs, you zag. Right. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, I've, I've seen some YouTube thumbnails out there. I haven't clicked on them. Uh, we're like, you know, the Raptors are playing, 
chess and everybody else is playing checkers like Masai is like six, you know, steps ahead of the NBA right now. And and that that may or may not be true, but I think what is true is that Masai understands, and some people will hate this, is that Toronto always will need to take an unorthodox path to contention. They will not necessarily be the person that will sign Anthony Davis or sign LeBron or sign Kawhi on the market and then go that route of competition. You almost have to think of outside the box and see what are the alternate paths we can take to contention. And if his experiment is to, you know, get guys who have a 40 foot wingspan everywhere and, and that's your that that's how you may discover a path to contention. I can accept that, but I don't, I don't I'm not accepting that Masai is a genius. I'm accepting that it might be necessary for him to think outside the box and try these avenues to compete in the modern NBA because as much as Toronto has progressed in the eyes of NBA players and every, everybody, it's still we, we we still have that little playing in Canada, you know that that stigma, which not as severe as it used to be for sure. but but I can see Masai's point. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, to zoom out even further, the Raptors aren't the only team trying to uh, innovate basketball in the NBA. Philadelphia 76ers are trying to be a post-centric offense, uh, and it was pretty good last year. It was very good. They often had three players posting up on the same possession. Um, the Houston Rockets tried with James Harden, to, you know, to be um, isolation basketball, which is actually – uh, becoming, it seems like the you know the Rockets died trying it, but other teams are picking up the seed, um, Atlanta Hawks, among others. So you know other teams are innovating. The Raptors are the only one innovating in this direction. I'm fascinated. It's going to be amazing to see how it turns out, win or lose. And and it's it's funny you mentioned that because you know I, I follow like tech a lot, and uh, you know in, in tech they always say yeah there's a first mover advantage. The first person who tries something they may have an advantage, but oftentimes. Uh, the first person who tries something isn't the one that's going to have the most success with it. It's the second person or the third person who learns from the first the first experiment's mistake. And your Houston example is perfect, where the isolation basketball and 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 just jacking up threes may not have worked out for them, but it worked for, worked out for for for, for, for other teams. Uh, you know, as it, like Golden State. Even I don't think Golden State was the first team to just jack up threes. I think it was still Houston and Phoenix and those guys who used to adopt that mentality. But it just happened to be that Golden State sort of put it all together. So maybe something similar is happening on the six nine wingspan. No, so, sorry, six nine height, seven foot four wingspan. Yeah. Whatever you call this era. There's those Denver teams with um, Ty Lawson, J.R. Smith. They were like the prototype for Golden State, I think. Those were yeah. fun teams. Anyway, we're getting off the beaten track. I, I, I hear you, man. So, uh, so yeah, I, I'm with Masai, um, mostly because I don't think we have too many options. Um, you know, mm -hmm. what did you – and this, this is kind of our, our third topic here, is that what do you make of the – of the Pascal Siakam rumors, if you if you assume them to be true, uh, and you assume that the Raptors, uh, maybe not anymore, but they had put him on the block, maybe he was a, a a possible piece that Masai had put on the on the on the shopping windowsill. W hypothesize what's going on in Masai's mind as he looks to uh, sort of ship Siakam. Yeah, I think um, there's a number of facts that we can sort of put the pieces together how we see fit. But on one hand, Siakam is a very good player. I think lost in a lot of the discussion around him is just he's extremely good at basketball. And people think he is bad because, you know, of late game situations last year. Well, 2019, 20, 2020, he was actually very good in late game situations, right? Small samples lend themselves to up or down streaks. Um, he is um, probably an all-star level player, not quite an all-NBA level player, right in that mixture there. Um, another fact is that he is not untouchable. Um, it seems sort of like uh, the Raptors tried to develop him in a way um, th where he can be um, a unique player type, you know, leverage offensive advantages, and he can do that to a point. Um, not as the, the the fulcrum that does it for everyone else. You know, he can cascade advantages excellently. You know, if someone else makes the makes a small one, he can make it much bigger. 
He can finish. He can create. Like he does a lot of things well, but none of what he does is irreplaceable. And in fact, none of what he does is irreplaceable on the roster. And so I think the other part of that is he is not untouchable, right? They're, if the Raptors saw an advantage to trading him, they would do it. Uh, and then the third aspect of it is he is uh, paid the most on the team, right? Uh, which I don't think really matters from the Raptors' perspective because uh, you can find value-added contracts anywhere. Um, in fact, there's very few guys who add value to a max contract. So you actually, most max guys don't, you know, live up to that. And that's fine. You can still win championships like that. So I actually don't really see an issue with that from team building perspective. But I think those three things combined create some dissonance, particularly considering what Siakam was supposed to be, what they were developing him, him into. Um, you know, he... Is, has proven he can be the second on a championship team, which is extremely rare. Most guys can't do that. But the Raptors have no path to getting a first, right? So is Siakam that valuable? I mean, it's uh, kind of messy, but it's proven that he wants to be in Toronto. He said it. The blow up with Nick Nurse, I think, was way overstated. Happens all the time in NBA locker rooms. Um, so I think there's really no pressure for a trade. It doesn't have to happen. Um, but we're sort of having to rethink our assumptions from the championship year and then the first half of the next season when we sort of um, might have uh, uh, gone too far in what we thought Siakam might become. Yeah. And, and, and what you're kind of alluding to there is the uh, is the idea of, uh, and this was considered as one of the motivations of, of looking to trade Siakam, uh, is, is this idea of like contention window. Like, whose window is it to actually compete right now and who are the players that need to be present on the roster if we are mm-hmm. if we want to make a push for a title three years from now man I, I find that so hard to it's it's so hard to thread that needle and, and say mm-hmm. we are going to contend two years from now and we may sell an asset that will not be peak two years from now but might be, either on the slight decline or, or some other, you know, form of, uh, of, of their career. It, it, it just, it just feels that whole idea of nailing a contention window risky and also not needed because it's not like the Raptors. It's not like we have like a 33 year old vet. We're trying to manage like Kyle Lowry is a good example who does not fit in the contention window. And sure enough, you shipped them out. It makes sense. But everybody else on the roster to me, even guys like Scotty Barnes, who are like 19, you plus three their age, maybe, maybe they go to 22, you plus three Fred's age, maybe he goes to whatever, 30, whatever he is. That That's still the same window. To me, that's still like you still have a reason to play these players together. You don't necessarily have to split them apart because they don't fit part of the window. Do you buy into the fact that we have guys on this roster that don't fit the same contention window? No, you're absolutely right. Uh, and... Look at any championship team. They have guys who are 22 playing a role, right? The Raptors did with Pascal Siak. The Lakers did with Kyle Kuzma. You know, teams always have young guys playing important roles. And like you said, if you focus too much on a window, then you might actually miss a chance to compete before that window is open. I think the Philadelphia 76ers might have missed, you know, their real chance earlier and now might be sort of selling high when their window is not closed. And so I think if you really try to hone in on, okay, we can only win at this time because of the ages. Yeah. It does limit you um, for no reason. And so I agree with you. And I think add all that together. And I just don't see why the Raptors would trade Siakam. They, They could, but there's no reason to, unless you think you're getting a better deal back, you know, just like anybody else in the NBA, you know, you trade anyone if you get a better deal back, but there's no other reason to trade Siakam, which I think a lot of people think there is. Yeah, um, absolutely. I, I think it's 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 always uh, it's like when you're it's like if you own a house, it's always good to kind of like reinforce the value of the house to see what you're going to get on the market for it. It doesn't mean you're looking to sell the house, but you might call a real estate agent and say, "Hey, man, can you appraise this?" Or you might put a, a sign outside just to see what you're going to get. So I, I think. This is the NBA equivalent of reinforcing your house's value by seeing what you can get for it without without necessarily wanting to sell it. Yeah, yeah. So uh, let's end off on uh, on our 
which was supposed to be our main topic, but we haven't even talked about it, is is the article that you wrote, um, I think, last week, uh, uh, analyzing the Raptors' uh, big man situation, uh, which was obviously, you know, I, I think you mentioned the article that if externally the biggest problems were COVID and Tampa Bay, internally it was definitely uh, the center. And, and one of the debates at the end of last season was, well, you know, if Ken Birch came in and was the starting center, would you be happy going into next season? And I think people were like, yeah, Cambridge is great. He's he's definitely a huge upgrade over what we had before. But that's we want we want to aim higher. But here we are with Cambridge as number one, and then number two is a Chu, I guess, and third is is Gillespie, um, and fourth is the guy uh, Decker. I think we 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 got Decker from um, some. Yeah, some, he's no center, but uh, he, he's well, well, yeah, he's not a center, but he can. Well, what does he play? Four? What is he? Like a wing. He's a three. He's a three. Um, okay. You know, he'll compete okay. with Yuta Watanabe for his roster spot. Okay. Okay. Um, so it's, 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 it's a three headed monster, I'd say f- at center. Mm-hmm. How are you feeling about the center position? And d- d- does the current lineup at center prevent the Raptors from doing things that they may want to do? Hmm. Good questions. Uh, I think I'm higher on Kem Birch than pretty much anyone I've spoken with. I mean, he is a, a legitimate defensive plus at the center spot. You know, even as a starter, he's like, like an, an above average defensive center. He's excellent, um, which seems to be what the Raptors are prioritizing. We spoke earlier about them zigging when the league was zagging. And Kem Birch is a good example of that. You know, we can teach him to hit a couple catch and shoot jumpers, they think. And he'll just play unbelievable defense. He'll protect the rim. He'll switch. He'll rebound. You know, he'll he'll force turnovers. Um, and that's enough. That's what they want from the rotation spot. And so I think a lot of people were, uh, they wanted Rashawn Holmes. Rashawn Holmes is a better turnover generator. Uh, Rashawn Holmes is a probably significantly better offensive player. Um, but I think Kim Birch is a more solid defensive player fit in better with the schemes. You know, they already have a Chris Boucher who kind of does what Rashawn Holmes does, uh, at least on the defensive end. And so I think they actually just said, well, Birch at this contract means more to us than Holmes at that contract. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's another insight into the way they're building their team. Achua could become, you know, the best of the bunch in three, four years. Uh, Anybody who's a freak athlete with a ridiculous motor can become amazing. I mean, look at Pascal Siakam. Uh, And he has both of those, not so much else, but the rest can be developed. Uh, So I think it's fine. I I am not upset by the way the Raptors ran the offseason, by the choices they made. Um, I think Birch uh, is excellent or was excellent with the Raptors, needs to prove he will be. That it's all contingent on can he play at the level he did for a few months with Toronto? Because if he can't, then it becomes a huge issue. And to be honest, he never did before he got Toronto. He was never that good in Orlando. So um, I think I might be overstating the certainty that he can play at that level for a season as a starter. Um, but if he does, then I have no issues whatsoever with the way the Raptors handled the rotation spot. Yeah, and and I'll comment on um, Chua and, and Birch a little bit. For, for Birch... I think the biggest biggest challenge for him will be the league sort of catching up to him, right? I think he took a lot of people by surprise uh, when he came to Toronto last year with the, the role the Raptors put him. He was a big part of our pick and roll game or pick and pop game. Uh, you know, he was he was he was a great passer out of the out of the pick and roll. Once mm-hmm. you once you shoveled the ball to him, he had the awareness of what's going on around him. So he used to look for the corner as he's falling back. There's a few instances yep. where he's passing the ball to the to the to the guy in the corner. So defenses will catch up to him because just the scouting report is out now. So it'll be always it'll be interesting to see how he reacts to that. Uh, and until that first adjustment is made by an NBA defense to a guy who's been who's 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 playing well, I'm always hesitant to pass judgment on it. Uh, so Birch is definitely a, a a wait and see for me to see how he responds to extended mm-hmm. minutes, more scrutiny, better scouting reports. Um, and and much like draft picks, man, I, you know, I've never had an opinion on draft picks, a, a, a strong opinion, because it, it even when the Raptors drafted Rafael Arroyo uh, over uh, Andre Iguodala, yeah, I wanted Iggy. But even at the time, I was like, eh, well, maybe, what do I know? You know what I mean? Maybe there's something <laughs> out there that people, you know, who knows? What do I know? So 
it, it's I've, I've always given the benefit of the doubt to the uh, to the management uh, when, when it comes to these these players because the scouting report is, has yet to go out. They haven't been tested. Same with Kemberge. I don't think he's been he's been fully tested by NBA scouts just yet. So I'm going to wait uh, wait till that. I think he'll be fine. Achua is interesting because man, this guy only plays in the face up. Uh, yeah, and when he catches the ball in the face up, you can almost see him think. Like you, you can see the gears turn as he's like, man, I wish I could like spin on this guy, but I don't have that move yet. So I'm just going to do this little, uh, little push shot that I have, or, or I wish I could like, you know, take this guy into the block, but I don't have that yet. So I'll try the skill that I presently have. I think we will need to be very patient with Achua because I want the Raptors to encourage him making mistakes and trying different things. Because as you said, I agree, he definitely is the guy with the highest upside, but that upside will come with a lot of mistakes this season, and we all have to be very comfortable with that. Agree. He could end up, you know, a Tyson Chandler, which, I mean, a lot of young people might only remember Tyson Chandler in Dallas. I mean, like young Tyson Chandler, like a freak finisher, unbelievable rim protector. Like, the Raptors haven't had a lot of center finishers abaco was close but he wasn't actually super efficient as a finisher uh mark marcus all definitely that wasn't his role you know Jonas valanciunas was really the last good finisher toronto's played at center uh, achua could become that uh which which is super valuable it would help frank Van Vliet a huge amount especially have a finisher of that caliber and achua could become that but as you as exactly you said um he needs to test his skills. He needs to play outside of his comfort zone, which, you know, uh, to end off the Achua thing on a, on a bright spot, Toronto has proven very willing to let players do. Birch has spoken openly. Oh, I come to Toronto. I can do other things. No, no team has let me before do, you know, Orlando. Um, and so hopefully Toronto gives Achua the same leeway and who knows what he could become. It could be excellent. Yeah. You know, at the same time, you always hear like new players come, joining a team and drop that line. I mean, I, I yes. remember Hito coming into <laughs> Toronto and saying, I will, I, will, I will handle the ball here, you know. Uh, Damari Carroll coming to Toronto. He's like, I'm more than just a defender. I can score. So there's always an element of like a new player. I, I sorry, <laughs> new place, new opportunities. But I think in this case, at least in this iteration of the Raptors management, we seem to have the infrastructure to support that mentality, whereas in the past, maybe mm-hmm. we didn't. Yeah, and the infrastructure, you know, the G League, um, I would have no problem if Achua, Barnes, any of these young guys see time in the G League. It would be good for them. There's no stigma attached anymore. Uh, I agree. The infrastructure is excellent. Yeah. And, and let, let's end off on um, on the, the other guy you talked about is, is Gillespie, who, you know, I, I'm never thrilled by that guy. I, I just feel he, he's a high motor banger of a player, uh, not necessarily highly skilled, but throws his weight around can you project him out a little bit for me? Like wh- wh- where, where does his career go? What's his next skill to develop? He, he's sort of like good at a few things, but not great at pretty much anything. The league is a little too fast for him right now. Passes come in too hot. You know, uh, he gets an offensive rebound and it takes him a beat to gather himself by which time defenders are already there. He, he just, he needs to improve his processing speed um, he's a very good athlete, but I think he needs to improve his, you know, his balance flexibility that like the yoga type of athleticism that Kyle Lowry was so excellent at, um, defensively, he is an incredible shot blocker, but often he will find himself a beat below the play or behind the play because he fell for some fluff on the other side of the floor. You know, he just, his thinking of the game, I think needs to improve the most, yeah. um, and once he has that, then his athleticism will really shine because he is extremely long, you know, great shot blocker. We saw that uh, a, a, a couple blocks in summer league. Offensively, he has a long way to go. But sometimes, I mean, I've seen him in the post uh, on a switch where he drops a shoulder, spins, goes up and dunks. And it's like, whoa, where did that come from? And he just, he needs time to develop that. I think the G League would be uh, really positive for him, but He's had time in the G League. I mean, he'd have to agree to that. He'd have to change his contract. Uh, I think Gillespie could very well have a future in the NBA. Might be a little bit of time from now, 
but it's hard to see that happening in Toronto right now. Yeah. And uh, let's let's leave it at that, man. I think we've hit the half an hour mark. Uh, I don't want to go too long. Um, you know, enjoy your Twitter uh, check mark, your new tab. Uh, you know, life is bright. Uh, you know, <laughs> even though winter's coming soon, you got the Twitter thing going for you. So uh, congratulations again. Thanks, brother. I appreciate it. And uh, always fun to chat some ball with you. Oh, also, we should mention because I know you uh, you're gonna you're gonna be there too. You signed up for sure. Is uh, the Rappers Republic is having its uh, three on three tournament on November 29th uh, at uh, Madame Athletic Center. Uh, it's the Ryerson's uh, Ryerson Rams gym on Young and College. Fantastic venue. Uh, if you haven't signed up, um, you know, check the website. Uh, the post is there, and we'll probably make another post soon uh, asking for registrations and all that. So some ball coming up in uh, in late November. Uh, it, it's always a good chance to see the community, the Twitter community, or, or, or a bunch of other people from from the uh, from just Toronto who we usually deal with electronically. You see them face to face. It's always a good time. I'm bringing the heat. I'm bringing a team this year. A couple of CIS level guys. It's going to be fun. Okay. Well, uh, I, I got my own CIS level guys. We'll see you there. <laughs>